Everybody, it's Jeff Die. Welcome back to Jeff Die's Friendship Podcast, episode one one four. If you speak numbers, that's one hundred and fourteen weeks of Jeff Die bringing you friendship, dog. Um, I don't know why I called you guys dog. In fact, when I said that, my dog just looked up at me like I was very weird. Sorry, Bubby. Um, what's going on, guys? Uh, last week took a week off. Uh, I have a good excuse for that. I will tell you at a later date. Um, but, uh, forgive me for that. And to make up for the lack of podcasts last week, we will be having a two episode week, which is what's happening right now. Uh, episode 114 coming at you real hot. This is my main man, Nemer, N-E-M-R, the original, the Jackie Robinson of comedy in the Middle East. He was the first, I'd say he's the best, which is subjective, uh, but he's a good, good man, a good friend of mine. I can't wait to do more stuff with this guy. He's awesome. I love him to death. Um, yeah, check it out. You guys are going to love this episode. Listen, if you want to watch this episode, if you want to look at me and the handsome Nemer, um, all you got to do is subscribe to my Patreon, Patreon backslash Jeff Die, um, and, uh, or just patreon.com slash Jeff Die. I think that's how it goes. I don't remember. Um, anyways, for a small fee, you get free stand-up comedy club tickets to all my shows. You get dibs on things first. Um, and you get to watch this episode. You get to watch all the podcasts uh, each week first. You can watch them instead of having to just listen to them. Um, and if you don't want to do all that, that's fine. Just go to iTunes, subscribe, go to All Things Comedy, say, hey, this podcast is great. Rate, review, whatever you can do. Uh, everything that you do that does that kind of stuff helps me. And it helps me build this into a bigger thing so I can provide more for people who care about what I'm doing. Uh, I love you guys. I hope you're good. Enjoy the episode. Enjoy my main man, Nemmer. Woo! Mr. Die! What's up, brother? Dude, first of all, uh, let me make you full screen. Let me take myself out of this. I want to show people your background. Oh, yeah. So It's just a green screen, you know? Those aren't real toys or anything <laughs> behind me. <laughs> I don't want anyone to think I'm some sort of nerd. Unless you're into toys, then those are real. Those are uh, 100% are you real. asking if I'm into toys? I got the Doom Eternal helmet right here. Well, I know you are, but you, there's a lot of people that might be watching that are like, what? Grown men with toys. Well, I mean, it's... I, it, I, okay, I was going to say something very bad, but I'm not going to say it anymore. Uh, I'm just going to say that um, y what you got going on is... I think if, if you're a grown man with toys, it should be the way you have it going on. Yeah, they're in cases. They're set up. It looks adult. You Let know? me ask you this. Like what would be deal? more creepy? Your setup? I don't find creepy at all. Or what's okay. his name? The uh, From uh, Fifty Shades of Grey when he had his playroom. Oh, yeah. That's way creepier. That should be way creepier. That, that is way, as far as I'm concerned, if you're- I've never had a lady over and be like, hey, can I put one of these toys in you? That's never <laughs> happened. They always just go, ah, we don't have to look at that, you know? Wait, uh, you've never done that. Is it because you don't want to ruin the value of your toys? Like, do you want <laughs> No, just because I'm not a weirdo like that uh, Christian Grey fella. Yeah, you know, like Christian Grey guy, like, he's, he's into some weird stuff, that guy. Can you imagine being a grown man and telling a girl, I want to show you my playroom? Yeah. Oh, and he was like, he was a sweetheart about it. He was like, whenever you're ready. I mean, yeah. he must have had some allegations already out about him. Because he's, he's like... Whenever you're ready, we don't have to go in there. When you're ready to go in there, if you want to stop, we'll stop. You know, it was very rape he sensitive. Had, it was very rape sensitive. He had, uh, uh, they had uh, safe words. Yep, and contracts. I think I remember a contract. There was a movie. contract. I <laughs> yeah. mean, that's sexy. Before we do this, girl, here's yeah. the paperwork. It just sounds awful. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's all these things are coming out with these guys and, uh, that movie was really ahead of its time, you know? It was. It definitely was. Uh, it was It was very Me Too friendly. 
Yeah. <laughs> in a well, you know what's funny is uh, there's a guy I like that I'm I'm nervous to even say his name because if everyone finds out how much I like him, they'd be like, ah, cancel Jeff Die. But there's a guy I like, and he was he finds it so fascinating that in the height of feminism and the women's movement, the number one selling book was Fifty Shades of Grey. Like that was like the not like it's kind of strange that that was. The I think same. Fi- I think Fifty Shades of Grey was like the first uh, collective porn experience for women. As a oh, bo- that could be. Yeah, for like, sure. Because like when we, I remember growing up when Pornhub became a thing, like it was a worldwide phenomenon. The reaction was enormous. Immediately everybody went for it. Yeah. And I think women found a way to be able to be like in public reading, you know, the closest thing you're going to get to porn in, in in writing that, that you know. Well, I always say that like, like so like all the women my age who like whenever Fifty Shades of Grey comes up, they'll be like, I didn't even like it. Like they love being the contrarian. That's like, I didn't even think it was hot. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I was like, yeah, it's not for you. You're young and hot. This is like you probably watch Pornhub like us, you know, like, but <laughs> like a normal person. Yeah. People like my mom are never going to watch Pornhub. But when they've, they've never gotten a filthy text message. M- my dad's never sent her like, I'm at work thinking about you. And it sends like a dick pic. He's never, that's never happened. So for my mom to run her eyes over the words like throbbing and anything that's like lustful like that. Like, I mean, we watched all the boomers. That's probably what it was. Like mostly like all the older generation that isn't, you know. No, isn't it? It's our parents' generation was really uh, like they they are the way they showed desire was very yeah. lacking in general. Yeah, it seems like a boring time to be alive unless you're like one of those hippies, you know, from like Woodstock. But even those that was creepy though. That fucking drugs and you're slipping shit into girls' drinks and you know I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but even then, those people all settled down. You know, they're like, oh, I went to Woodstock when I was 18, but then I found your mom, and you know, everybody gets a deal, so they all get married. <laughs> You don't, you, you're not, uh, would it be fair to describe you as, um, anti-marriage or not pro-marriage? How, 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 what's the best way? Yeah. I mean, that is the best way to describe it. I'm pro like adventure. I want, I love having women in my life. I love all, you know, I'm open to a relationship, but marriage seems like a big scam to me. I, I saw one of my favorite sets for you and I've seen you do it live is when you talk about, um, forever. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the bit is basically just about how like we we say the word forever like it's so romantic, but dude, that's a f- terrifying word. It is. Like pe- people say forever, but they don't they don't even know what they're talking about. That I mean they don't. They really yeah. don't. It's a big commitment, man. Walk around, look at how many bad tattoos you'll see. And you should stop everyone. Hey, what was that? And you like they always roll their eyes. Oh, well, I got that when I was whatever, you know. That's <laughs> that would be the same thing that people do with marriage, where they go, I, I can sign up for forever. I'm 19. What could go wrong? I scary marriage. I think I'm 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 very pro marriage personally. Yeah. Uh, but I'm very pro marriage to the right person. And like after you've really gotten to know each other, you've lived with each other. What blows my mind is people who get married never lived with each other before. Oh yeah. And then. Yeah, the- a lot of conservatives do that, especially like, um, you know, like American Western culture, mm-hmm. like uh, Christians. Yeah, they're like, oh, we, we we can't move in together. We, we're not even married yet. You're like, maybe give that a test <laughs> run before you commit to forever. Did you ever get close? Uh, not really. There was a girl I would have married, uh, mm. but, uh, you know, that wasn't it didn't make it that far. OK, well, that's that's I mean, she already had a husband. What am I supposed to do? You know? God damn it, Jeff. <laughs> well, no, the, I will say the uh, I from all the books I've been reading, and anytime I say I've read a book, I've never read a book in my life. Uh, but I li- I've probably listened to over four hundred audio books on Audible. Like I'm like, oh. that's how I don't do podcasts. I just listen to books. And that's okay. how I learn. Some people are better listeners than they are readers. You know, true. Well, and um, what's your favorite book that you ever listened to? Uh, Ted. Uh, Ted. I just said Ted Bundy. Yeah, I thought uh, that was you were going for. Yeah, like, no, Ted Turner's autobiography. Oh, I've never read it. He's he's a genius. He's I, the coolest guy in the world. Okay. I want to be like him. But what I was gonna say is, uh, for, I remember reading a book where they were saying like, you know, marriage is ain't shit unless you have kids. But if you have kids, all the data suggests you stay married for those kids. Like they have yeah. a way better success rate. They have a much healthier life. Like even if you two are driving each other crazy, you'll stick it through it. 
you've got to. That's that's the whole thing. And said, if you're married and you don't even have kids, that's just like a tax break. But yeah, that's, <laughs> you, you have a you have a girlfriend. You have a boyfriend. That's all that is. It's is you act like you're doing something heroic. It's it's not. But like if you're if you have kids, that's what I can see how marriage would. I, I'm pro marriage if you have kids. I, I I actually agree with you. If you're gonna get married and not start a family, why are you? What's the point? Don't get married. I I, yeah. I think marriage is for the family. Like you have to build something together. Instead of being forced to kind of hang out, I mean that's just my personal view. And if otherwise you, they're doing the same thing I'm doing, just being like, yeah, we're we're together. Yeah. All right. Well, that's low stakes. <laughs> and I'm totally pro if you can't get kids, adopt a kid, foster. You know what I'm saying? Like create a oh, yeah. an environment where you can do that. Um, there, was, what I've always found uh, interesting, my uncle uh, who's still single, um, and uh, he he used to say that marriage. Uh, he's I'm Middle Eastern, so in Arabic he would say, but I'll translate it to English. He said marriage is like somebody comes with a bag full of snakes, and then they tell you there's one fish inside, and they say put your hand in. And uh, put your faith in God. That's what he said. Oh, he was like, it, he had God. the most negative view of marriage I've ever heard in my life. And then one day, a few years ago, he calls me out of nowhere. I think he's in his 50s now. And he calls me and he says, I've, I've, I was up last night and I'm very worried because I'm afraid that I may have had an impact on you. And I said, well, what's up? And he goes, I've, I now realize that I'm too difficult to I can't I'm not malleable like I've, bec I've been with myself for so long Very I've been, rigid. I'm too rigid I'll never be able to be with a woman and I now realize that all of the things I've been saying are completely false you need a life partner you might end up like it was a very weird conversation. He was yeah. just panicking out of nowhere. But I like that he was reflecting. He was going, "Oh man, I shouldn't have said." I all shouldn't those have things. said all those things in front of just which, which is kind of like my comedy. I'm doing it because it's <clears throat> jokes, you know. Yeah. Uh, any woman who's ever like intimately knows me know that I'm I'm pretty soft guy and I'm a nice guy. I just love jokes. It's so fun. Which is kind of how I'm like afraid I'm gonna get in trouble soon. Is like. I love things I shouldn't love when it comes to humor. Like, mm. I like all the humor about good things, too, but I find racism pretty funny. I find, uh, I find womanizing very funny as long as we're trying to be funny. Yeah, Obviously, that's you got to have something. The, exactly. It's not shock humor. I, I know your, right. your comedy very well. Yeah, you're, well, you're actually. Well, that's the thing. It's like I don't like womanizing. I don't think racism is acceptable in any way, shape, or form. But when it comes to jokes, I do find that stuff really funny. <laughs> like I really do. Although I do want to clarify, I've seen your comedy. Your definition of yeah. jokes about racism doesn't. You don't. You're not a race. Like you're not. No. Race. I. I just want to make sure they're that they're more racial. They're racial jokes. It's not. But that's not racism, though. Like if I'm. I know, but nowadays. Yeah. Anything's considered racism, you know, yeah. from young people. Like just even saying like if you said like black people are the best, they'd be like, He can't joke about black people. Or if you're like rape is bad, they're like, he said rape. Like that's all oh, they hear. Yeah, that I know. Yeah. When I first yeah. came here, I used to you know, back in the Middle East, I because in the Middle East it's con context is what matters very much. Words don't that's matter. Right. It's always like, What did you mean by that? Oh, that's I would love that. It's I'm, people ask me here when I go, they're like, you know, what can you say in America you can't say in the Middle East? I start laughing. I'm like, it's the other way around. That's great. See, they're uh, listening to the point. And here's the thing. They'll let you say anything as long as there's a point to it. So shock humor does not go over well. So if I want to make a, a religious joke in the Middle East just for the fuck of it, right? never going to go over well. Not gonna if, work. I, if I make, if I make a, a, a joke about cars with no point yeah. to it, they're just going to sit there. They won't laugh. Like if you say something shocking just to shock people, it's not going to work. But if, if you have anything clever to say yeah. that's like a perspective, they'll laugh. Yeah. That says a lot about their intellect. Oh, I mean, a lot. Yeah, no. They're, if a collective audience is coming up with that, I mean, that's fantastic. That's very kind of you to say. The The Middle East is uh, unfortunately constantly ruled by people who don't represent it. Like, we're, we're, we're enslaved. We're pretty much an enslaved people in the sense that we don't really have control over our destinies and our lives. Right. But the, but the, the, the result of that is that we've, we've compensated by really going the distance uh, with one another. So we've kind of really had to experience and one. You're another. like women, women in comedy, you know, yeah, their destiny is really, you know, it's, 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 it's not going to happen, but <laughs> they've stuck together. Yeah, they have. Women in comedy have stuck together. That's actually, a good, that's an interesting analogy. I was like, what? <laughs> okay. Women in comedy are like a lot like Arabs is an analogy. <laughs> I never thought 
Well, aren't you like the um, aren't you like the Jackie Robinson of comedy over there in the Middle like East? You were like, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I was called the king of comedy. And I always used to joke, it's very easy being the king of comedy when you're the only guy doing it. Right, but you were the first. Right? I was the first for many years. Yeah, it was yeah. just me, and now there's a huge scene with incredible right. stand-up, uh, you know, comics coming up. But I'm still the guy. I've put out like I'm I'm putting out my eighth special right now. So I've I've been nice. for almost twenty years. So I put so in the legwork. So yeah, I'm very yeah. well known there. Thank God, and people still like me. I haven't fucked anything up yet. Yeah, thankfully. I love that. I, well, you know. um, getting back, to, I took us off on a little olive branch there, but the um, when I joke about marriage, I wrote all that because all my married friends had all this marriage material. So I was like, I'm gonna sit down and write, you know, what my what my situation is. I'm a single guy. I'm not married, so I'll write jokes about being like, you know, don't worry about me. I'm doing okay. I don't feel the need to get married. And that slowly evolved into like, oh my God, this guy must hate uh, women or this guy no. must like, he, he thinks like, he thinks, uh, oh, marriage is so bad and I'm married. Is he judging me? So I've had to like mold the jokes into being a little bit more, um, you know, Di I'm not trying digestible. to shit on marriage. I just don't yeah. want to do it. And I imagine there's a lot of people in the crowd who can are in the same position, you know, so it's just fun. No, I, I agree. And, and you're also the nicest fucking dude well, thank uh, you very in much. the industry as far as I'm concerned. I've known you for a yeah. while. Every time we meet up backstage, and like, and everybody loves you. And I don't, yeah. you've never, you. I've never heard anybody say a single bad word about oh, you. very nice. Ever. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Which is I, difficult. I love people and that's why I got into this business, man. I get to hang out with cool comics. I get to meet new strangers after every show. I get to literally go and get attention from Hundreds of people. It's a. It's the best job in the world. It is the best job in the world. But you've also branched out beyond stand up. Uh, yeah. And you've acted in quite a few things. Yeah. And, and <laughs> so I want to ask you about uh, the show you did with William Shatner, George Foreman, uh, yeah. and all of those guys. You, Terry Bradshaw, and Henry Winkler. And yeah. And I mean, you were the one young dude in yeah. the entire cast. You uh, had the funniest takes in all of your interviews. Oh, thank you were so you, much. That, you, that show was so fun. That was one of the funnest shows on TV. You busted yeah. everybody's balls. What was it like? For I know you've been asked this a million times. No, I, I've got a good answer for that. Like, what was it like hanging out with those guys? Yeah, man. Because, I mean, yeah. it's, it's just, it's such an, I mean, I don't know if that happens where it's like one young dude and then yeah. everybody, like, and the old guard. Do you know That's what I'm saying? Fine. Absolutely. I live, one of these doesn't belong, you know? And, and the reason that is, is that um, I'm trying to look up William Shatner's age. I think he's 89 now. Is he? I've been he has a YouTube channel where he reviews wine. <laughs> that's so weird. Yeah, he's 89 years old. So 89. the reason that's important is because I was supposed to represent like the viewer. Okay. So like if the person watching was to be like, well, what would it be like if I was on vacation with these four gentlemen? You know? Mm -hmm. And so like you're kind of watching it through the lens of me if you were there. Um but those guys, you know, William Shatner's 89. The other guys are in their 70s, uh, I think 80s now. Uh, I wasn't starstruck. Like, when I met them, they weren't like my guys. Mm. These were like my mom and dad's guys. Yeah. These are my friend's dad's guys. So for me, like, if I would have been with, like, Hulk Hogan, Ken Griffey Jr., you okay. know, like, if, if, I, if those were the four that I was with... <sighs> I would have every morning would have woke up like Ugh. I wouldn't have known like what to do. But the fact that once I met Terry, once I met George, Henry and Bill, I was just kind of like, cool. These are like my pals now. Like I'm one of the gang. So I'd, I, I would bust their chops. I'd prank them at lunch all the time. Like I would literally screw around with these guys when even when we weren't filming. And then like I would go out and party with like the camera crew and I'd come back at like 2 a.m. I'd like knock on their hotel room doors. Like I just I, I liked <laughs> being their young kind of rascally grandson or something or i guess it'd be son for some of them but uh, yeah. you know I, I, I it was easy for me because i wasn't like starstruck by them i it, it was very apparent you guys looked like the best of friends yeah we're, it, well i talked to terry literally you know i called him on father's day he called me the next day but we were on the phone forever like two days <laughs> before that so like we're all really close bill is probably the most distant from all of us but that's just because uh, he's he's always got so many things going on, and yeah. I don't think his inner circle is pretty small. But the other guys and us all we all talk. That's fucking dope, man. So yeah, it's cool. How did you succeed 
at growing up, but not growing up at the same time, because I think that's an <laughs> achievement. That's what I, that's how I describe myself. I'm literally yeah. I want to make clear I'm not shitting on you. I'm actually yeah. that's I think why me and you get along so well. I play yeah. video game. I'm going to be streaming a video game right after this. I uh, I'm basically uh, and I love this shit. I think it's the yeah. best. And I think people who aren't into it are missing out on so much. But I want to I want you to kind of just like tell me from your perspective, what is it about all of this and why? Well, I like to take, you know, I think that the way humans have made nature, right? Like, like, think about that. We like to have all of the things we love from nature, you know, like a waterfall or like a pond or, or animals or like, a, we, we like a garden. We're, we're always trying to recreate what the Tao or your God or all or whatever what we're always trying to we really uh, humans have always been obsessed with nature right okay but what but what do we do we try to get rid of the part of nature we don't like we, mm. we try to get rid of the spiders and the bugs and we don't like when a wasp's nest is in our garden we're always trying to reject that snake out of there you know mm -hmm. i feel like when i was growing up like that's what i'm trying to do i want to take all the good parts of being an adult you know like i want um i want meaning I want, uh, I want a solid friendships. I want to be able to do what I want, freedom to stay awake when I want, eat what I want. I want, I crave sex. I crave like a, an intimate relationship with a partner. Uh, but there's a lot of good stuff about being a kid that I'm not willing to get rid of. And why should we? So we cherry pick from youth and cherry pick from adulthood. Um, and I think that's the best part about our, being our age is that like, uh, I think the generations before us, you were scoffed at if you held on to yeah. anything from your child. Yeah. They're like, yeah, hey, boys don't play with toys anymore. You're a man now. You know, get to the iron mill. And, and you know, it's like that was kind of – whereas now it's not. It's more acceptable. We're saying, hey, if you like wearing a Scooby-Doo shirt, wear a Scooby-Doo shirt, but also get your ass to work on time. Like it's okay to yeah. have both. Yeah. And I think, that's, I think that's just human evolution. Like we're taking the best from this and we're taking the best from that and, and marrying them together. What are your favorite things from childhood that you've carried on into adulthood? Uh, pro wrestling. Okay. Uh, baseball, or just really any sports, but definitely baseball. Uh, mascots. I'm a huge fan of mascots. I think they're the best. I think they're the original comedians. Like when you're a little kid, that's the first comedian you see. Oh, shit. That's a very interesting take, actually. Yeah, yeah. So they are. I, I, I was into humor when I was like, before I can remember, because I remember laughing at like the San Diego chicken and the Mariner moose and all these like, they'd be at my sporting events. And I'm like, why do people even care about those men down there? <laughs> like, that chicken is hilarious. And look, he's running the bases and he's messing with that guy. He pants the umpire. And so I, that's why I've really always loved mascots. Plus, mascots are very innocent. They get mm. to be comedians to, you know, like, Young, ask any five-year-old if he likes George Carlin. He he, do, he doesn't, yeah. you know. No. It's, in a, it's inappropriate. But, like, for him, like, if you bring in Pluto from Disneyland and he, like, takes his hat off and puts it on his nose and whips it around, like, it's these kids' laughter. It's just so it's so great. But I think they're, like, the first comedians. I agree. I, I think that from ch what I love about childhood and carrying things with me, like, I have a, a copy of Mega Man 3, a video game uh, on Nintendo. Great game. My favorite game of all time. Yeah, great game. And I and I when I became an adult, I always told people I used to be a kid, now I'm a kid with a budget. So Yeah, when, absolutely. When I grew up, the first thing I did when I had some money was I tracked down a copy of Mega Man 3 in its box with the catalog. Nice. Because I don't know of How any How much did that run? A couple hundred bucks? Yeah. It it cost me about $800. Oh, 800. Yeah. yeah was, that's more than I thought. Yeah. Cuz it's in good shape. It's it all was the original in, stuff. I wanted it in good shape because yeah. when I when I received it, I opened it up and I took the catalog out. And it, Im I immediately felt what I had not felt since I did that the first time. Oh, nice. Yeah, and it's a great feeling. It's that innocence because it, it, you immediately get that, that feeling of when things were less complex than now. Absolutely. And I know a lot of people do yoga and they do a lot of stuff, but I find that if you take some time out of your day to enjoy the things that bring you a lot of value, you know, uh, we're, I'm playing a game now called Senua's Sacrifice and the story and the narrative is so powerful. It's like reading the greatest book and you're sure. getting to experience it. And you see it from the perspective of a character and, and all of this. And it's a visual art form and all that. So it's giving you so much. But in an art form that reminds me, makes me feel when things were a lot simpler. I think it's such a positive experience. I it don't... is a positive experience. Well, I think and like one thing that's cool about modern times is like if you held on to any of your baseball cards – they're not worth anything. No. If you held on to like the hobby world, it's over. The internet has exposed it. They didn't just make 
20 Ken Griffey Jr. rookie cards, they made $10 billion, which yeah. means they're not worth anything, and anybody can get one from anybody on the internet. Word. But the positive of that is that you can now buy anything you wanted from your childhood for a pretty reasonable price. Yeah. And so, like, I can literally play Ken Griffey Jr. baseball like, yep. in my living room yep. from the Super Nintendo with the same controller, with everything. Um, I can just buy that off craigslist for 75 for bucks. nothing i yeah, so i bought so mega great. man i bought mega man 3 the copy that i keep and then i have mega man 3 the copy that i play i bought it for 10 bucks yeah exactly and there's pl there's places that like you can go to that have all this stuff uh just like on the shelf so you can go in and buy it like it's an old hollywood video or something 100%. so i i love that um what was your favorite movie growing up my favorite movie growing up yeah Pro probably happy gilmore Oh shit, that's a great that's a great We choice. must have watched it like five hundred times one summer. We don't do we don't do that anymore. Where like you, no. you watch a movie and then you watch it like over and over and over again. Well, I think it was like looking back on it, this is before I was like aware of like sex and stuff. Like I was aware that what sex was, but mm -hmm. I didn't know how many people were actually engaging in it. Mm -hmm. And my sister, <laughs> who's older than me, her boyfriend would come over and he'd like hang out with me and like say what's up and he'd sit in the, in the living room and he'd be like, let's watch Happy Gilmore. And I was like, yeah, and I'd put it in. And then after like 30 minutes, he would inevitably just like go leave. It's like I knew like now I know like what he was doing for sure. But at the time, I was just like, man, me and Jeremy, we're friends, man. We play Happy Gilmore every, or we watch Happy Gilmore every single day of summer. <laughs> so <laughs> gross. <laughs> it was gross. Oh my goodness. Uh, did you ever get into action movies when you were growing up? Were you like a Schwarzenegger fan and, you know, Terminator well, 2, so that stuff? I watched a little bit of it. I didn't realize how much I was obsessed with that till I got to this age. Mm. Those are my favorite movies now, like Mad Max, uh, pretty much any like simple, like, action movie from mm -hmm. the 80s and 90s is like my 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 jam like they live um gosh i'm trying to think what's the one with uh kurt russell or no patrick swayze and keanu reeves uh uh where they jump from the airplane uh, point break point break yeah yeah and i didn't see point break till like a year ago my friends were like they know me and they're like it's they know so i just good. love they're like i love anything with like a big truck and like monster if there's a jet ski on fire like that's my movie like don't <laughs> Don't show me a movie that's like, oh, uh, it, it has this intellectual meaning. It's an allegory. Like, I don't. No, I don't light like a jet that. ski on fire. Dude, if it's got like, yeah, like a big giant guy shooting a flamethrower at a monster, like that's my movie. <laughs> so all my friends were like, dude, you got to watch this. You got to watch this. You got to watch this. And they're like 100 for 100. Every movie that I've watched, I'm like, yep, that's the best movie. Fuck. So Speed, you must have loved Speed. Love Speed. But I watched that when I was a kid. Okay. What was the, I'm trying to think of the one. Oh, Roadhouse. Yeah. So awesome. That's with Patrick Escape. Swayze, right? Yeah. Yep. Escape from LA, Escape from New York with Kurt Russell. I was, uh, the, yeah, sorry. That's it. I just, I love those kind Dude, of Dude, I, I was, I think, eight years old when, uh, or seven or something when Terminator 2 came out. Oh, and so I, good. I begged my parents to let me watch it. They didn't fucking know what Terminator. Plus, I'm, as an Arab, there's no like rated R. Nobody gives a shit. Uh, oh, really? So yeah, why'd you have to beg them? No, because they have to buy it. Oh, I see, I see. VHS used to be like 50 bucks or something. Do you remember back in the day you want to buy a tape? It was like a, a fucking... I think it was. Yeah, I remember that being expensive. It was expensive. Or you go to Blockbuster to rent it, you know? Yeah. I grew up in San Diego. My parents, for them, it's like, you know, you're an Arab. You, you see war in actual life. Like, people get murdered that you know and stuff. So they're like, it's a movie. Who gives a shit? So right. um, I got Terminator 2. I think I was like eight or seven years old when I watched it. And it affected me. On, it's a fucking violent movie. Oh my gosh, yeah, it's a real deal. Dude, it affected me on such a visceral level. I must have seen that movie maybe a hundred times. Like, just really? over and over and over again. And right now when I watch it, it just it makes me so happy to see that film again. Well, well see, wait, you're saying you love when you... Like, Mega Man's obviously your favorite game. Yeah. But, like, what games do you play the most? Do you play... Like old eight bit games, or do you like? I play. I have like, all the eight bit games, but I, I I love modern games. But I like third okay. person, like third person games. I like it has to have a story. Okay. Like I I need to be invested in the character. I don't. Right. If the combat's great and everything's great, I'm fine with that. I'll play yeah. it for a bit. But if I don't have like a feeling of like I must overcome this for whatever, like I can get invested. I love. I'm a comic. I love storytelling. That's like sure, of it's my passion. So any game with an incredible story, like Doom, the latest Doom came out, Doom Eternal. And a lot of people are like, whatever, just skip the story. The fact that they added a story into it made the game for me so much better. I and think every game developer has learned it needs a story. Yeah. Which you, some people say, oh, well, 
of course, duh, like every game has had a story. And it's like, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Street Fighter used to be just pick a guy, pick a guy, fight him. Mortal Kombat was pick a guy, pick a guy, fight him. Mm -hmm. NBA 2K, it's like pick your favorite team. Go be uh, Scottie Pippen because Jordan's not in this one. Uh, but like you can <laughs> – all those games learned, nope, it needs a story it mode. It does. Like, and, and or else people aren't going to care about all these new muscly Mortal Kombat characters that we added. Uh, yeah. Even NBA 2K, it's like create a player and make your way up through the league. Like we all need those stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you played Red Dead Redemption? That's the one game I have. I know I have to play. I just never had the time to, and but I'm getting yeah. to it very soon. I heard it has like one of the best stories. Yeah, I, I mean, just start with Red Dead Redemption Two, the new one that came mm -hmm. out. New one. It's yeah, been like two years or something. Yeah, but, but yeah, I am going to start with that one. It's, it's phenomenal. It's so good that I used to not even like like westerns and like stuff like that. But this game came out at the same time as the Coen Brothers film, um, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Okay. Which is like one of my favorite movies. It's incredible. But I used to hate westerns. I used to hate that time period. I hated that whole thing. And then the mixture of Red Dead Redemption 2 with The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, now I'm obsessed. I've went back and watched all the westerns. Oh, I love wow. cowboys. I think everything. But just because of that game. It was that I heard it's like it's unbelievable. It's phenomenal. I don't play games like that. I play Mortal Kombat. I play King Griffey Junior Baseball. I play But even Mortal uh, Kombat now has has a very deep lore and story in it. Well, they always have just not in the game. Yeah. So when I was a kid, the way I would get obsessed is I would just learn everything I could about each character. Mm. And I knew everything. And then they tried to like when sixty four came out. They made a really crappy version, and then they tried to make like a Sub Zero like role playing yeah, game. Yeah, that was terrible. And then it, was, it was just all awful. Yeah. But then it started catching up. I think Mortal Kombat has a more complex story than Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, any of that stuff. It's insane, dude. Like they, they, the lore has gotten so deep on those games. Why have they not made like a whole TV series or like films? They, they've like, tried. Have you seen the old Mortal Kombat movies? I've so one of them uh, was dog shit. I saw that one. Then they made one three years later that was dog shit. I saw that one. And then they made these things called uh, Mortal Kombat, like I think Legacy or something like that. Yeah, maybe. It's, like Mortal, it's something like that. Mortal Kombat, and then it's a word. Yeah. And they were like these real short ones, and you can watch them on Amazon. Uh, I didn't and, know that. Actually. And they're actually pretty good. Okay. The I don't mind them. The first movie wasn't that that bad, like that came out in the 90s, because when it, when it came out, if you watch it now, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a disaster. But I the, hated it. The first one was like compared to what came later, it was just the, what, what, it's so the, bad. the later movies were basically porn level acting. Right. It was well, and also, you know, the guy who plays Buffalo Bill. Yeah. He was Shao Kahn. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. Do you You're remember? Like, wait a sec. Do you remember Street Fighter with Jean-Claude Van Damme? Yes. That was what a shit show. So bad. That's Jean-Claude Van Damme. You know, he was supposed to be Johnny Cage from Mortal Kombat. Oh, really? They approached him. They were going to have like all these characters in Mortal Kombat 1. It was going to be like an Eastern mysticism guy because uh, everyone was obsessed with like Kung Fu movies. Like, okay. the, you know, like because of Bruce Lee. So they made Liu Kang. That was like the first character. They're like, okay, he's kind of like a Bruce Lee type, you know? And then we'll have like an army chick, Sonya Blade. She'll be like this hot blonde, but she's not to be trifled with. Mm -hmm. And they're just going through everything, you know? We'll have a one side of this ninja rebellion and then this is the other side of the ninja rebellion and their leaders are scorpion and sub-zero yeah and they, they're doing all this the god of thunder raiden and then they were like well we should have one guy who's like a hollywood actor and uh but he's like a badass so they reach out to jean claude van damme and jean claude van damme's like oh no i'm not gonna be in a video game like i'm doing you know i'm i'm doing wow. stuff and i think he was doing whatever like one of his main movies that was, was a mistake a huge mistake because he would have been, it would have been John Claude Van Damme and Raiden, and so it'll be this whole thing. So like, fuck him. Let's just make a, we'll just make like a Johnny Hollywood Cage. actor of our own. Like, we'll give him a funny name, and like he'll be kind of like this douchey guy. And they made him kind of douchey because John Claude was so douchey to them about not doing it. And then I later, did not know that. Yeah. Then later, John Claude Van Damme was in a game. He was in, I think maybe the Street Fighter game yeah. or whatever, or he was in some sort of game. Yeah. I don't think it was Street Fighter. He no, made, it wasn't. Like, he just acted in Street Fighter, but then they put him in a video game. I, I, it was some obscure yeah. title. I can't even remember. Maybe Virtua but, Fighter or something. I can't remember. And it was bad. I mean, it was horrible. Like wildly not good. But he'd have made just so much money. Did you see his new show, JCVD? No. It's fucking fantastic. Oh, really? But what's the? Is it scripted or is it like a reality show? It's scripted. It's okay. basically the the premise of it is is that Jean Claude Van Damme was o the the acting career was his he plays himself it was a cover he was actually a secret agent 
That's awesome. It is one of the funniest shows I've ever it's what seen. Steven Seagal wishes people thought about him. A hundred percent. And it's endearing. <laughs> his character development is really sweet in the nice. in the show. His acting's on point and the action sequences, like the fight scenes, are phenomenal. I, I gotta watch that. Yeah, it's on sure. Amazon. It on? I, I on Amazon. So go oh, I okay. like I can't recommend it enough. I was oh, yeah. back when we were able to tour around, I was watching it in a hotel room, like and I stayed up all night, binged the whole season. That's what's so funny, is I feel like comics are doing what everyone's like. What everyone's doing in quarantine is what we used to just do when we were like in our hotel room. Has quarantine been like, difficult it, for you? Um, socially it has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like I'm so I always want to be like out. Luckily, no one cares anymore, so I'm seeing everyone. So it's mm. been very good. But like, dirt, for the first two months, I had to like sneak people into my house and sneak people <laughs> out of my house and <laughs> pretend on social media that I was taking the quarantine serious. But I remember like, do you Jesus remember when? Christ, Jeff. It's true, man. I don't. Get, I I cared zero. Also, I must know never how how many people do you know? A ton. Probably thousands. Maybe yeah. if you if you count all your fans. Yeah. Million millions. Billions. No. How many people do you know personally that have corona? I actually I actually know a few. Uh, how many? I probably I in everybody remember I'm international, so that's why. But I right. I've, I've actually know about twelve people who got it and three who died. Oh my god. Yeah. See I I know zero. zero. I know zero people. And I've asked this question to probably forty people and nobody's come up with anybody. Everyone just goes, I don't really know anyone. True. I mean, we're all aware. But we live real. in Los Angeles where there's I mean, it's more if you go to like to the southern states, I think, where they're not taking care at all. Yeah. That I think you'll well, probably I was end in up Arizona last weekend. Nobody knew anyone who had it. I was in Texas, San Antonio, Texas, the week before. So are you nope. saying are you saying that nobody really got it, or are you saying the people who got it and died just weren't 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 popular? Well, no, I'm saying that the um, I think that this is like a super flu, and I think mm. what it's really affecting is is the elderly it and is. effect and affecting the nursing the nursing homes. Yeah, is a fucking travesty. What so happened? That's, that's what's sad, and I think you know, and I'm not saying that it's not a really, really big deal, and I don't envy anyone in power who has to deal with this shit. Yeah, but I also think, you know, when you shut down a whole comedy club and you shut down a whole coffee shop and you shut down a whole, I mean, there's a lot of lot of other collateral damage that's happening, and I I just don't know anyone, so I wear the mask, I keep a distance, but mm. I'm not afraid, and I, don't, I always you know I always was kind of a opinion. Like I took a look at New Zealand. They did a shutdown for two months, like a serious fucking shutdown, as yeah. did Australia. And now it's like they have New Zealand has zero cases. Uh, That's great. Uh, Australia has barely any cases. And I think if, if it was done properly from right. the get go, I don't think it would have had that much of an effect. I think we could have really controlled it. I think what was the problem was like they were like, yeah, we're shutting down Los Angeles. But then I'd look outside and everybody was running around. And yeah, they're having, all at, the, at Runyon Canyon. Yeah. So I always it was ridiculous. So I was wondering to myself, like uh, if if America had a better attitude towards it, I don't think it would have been this hyped up. It would. Have, I think we could have easily overcome this shit. Uh, Lebanon, yeah. my country, they shut down the airport, shut down the country because the country is on the brink of collapse. So they can't handle an outbreak like they can't they we don't have the hospital beds we're not going to be able to afford it it's so they're like shut just fucking shut it down and they did and we're pretty much over it now i mean we still have a few cases here and there it's gonna happen but our hospitals we have enough beds we have everything i think it was just like well there's the big difference and this is what happens when anybody debates country to country comparison mm -hmm. is that like a lot of these countries have like five million people and we have like 30 million just in los angeles yeah Mixed it's with the fact of how privileged Americans are. They're not used to anything being taken away from yeah. them. They fucking found a way to get their dogs in restaurants. You know, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll just lie and say it's a service, service animal. Service animal. We, we just do anything we want. That, like, that's why I get so mad when, when, when Americans complain about anything. It's like you... We can just be a different gender now because we think we are. We, we can... We, we, do, we do anything. And we... We, we, if we get yelled at for smoking a joint, uh, we just pull out a vape. And if they say you can't have a vape, we pop a gummy. We find a way to do anything, anything we want. I, and yeah. so t telling a bunch of privileged Americans uh, who think that they're poor because they only make 60 grand a year, <laughs> that like telling them to not do anything – it's just not gonna happen. Like they, they just can't help themselves. I can't believe I can't believe that people aren't wearing masks. I mean, it's yeah. such a simple. Requ it's such an easy. It shouldn't be controversial. So easy. Yeah, it's what do you, very. What do you, 
I actually, I this is something about me, not people, nobody knows, but I actually, this, some of my friends know this, but the public doesn't. I love masks. I love it because I'm a huge Mortal Kombat mark. That's been my game forever. I've played every version, all 25 Mortal Kombat games that ever existed. I was all in. I could, I could tell you the whole story, name any character. I could tell you their whole backstory, everything, how they were created. So what I've been doing is I've been 3D printing like Mortal Kombat masks. That's fucking dope. Painting them, and I've been wearing them out in public. The reason I haven't posted it on my social media is because I want to get a collection of all the masks that I've made. Okay. So I've made Sub-Zero, <laughs> Scorpion, Aaron Black, Cabal, Noob Cybot, uh, Reptile... I have another scorpion, so two scorpions. That's all I've made so far. But I, it's been so like therapeutic to just sit there and like listen to books and like make these little masks. Brilliant. And I wear them out in public. It's been uh, brilliant. It's been fun. That's yeah, what. Fun. That's what. I, for me, I was just like, why don't people just have fun, make masks? It's yeah. a. It's a very minor inconvenience. I've gone. I go running. I wear a mask while I go running or riding my bike. Is See, it that's this, tough? It, it, I mean, but here's the thing. It's not because when you're running, you're you're breathing heavy. You're breathing. Right? I mean, yeah, but unless you have the mask literally like on your face, like you, which you don't. I mean, it's but, it's not that bad. It's like after ten minutes, you really forget that it's on. Oh really? See, you, I have I have only not worn the mask during working out, and that's because one, I've barely worked out. I've worked <laughs> out once in the three months. Okay, fair enough. And then also two is like. Uh, I don't know. I just didn't try it. I, I, I was like, I'm running. I gave it a shot. I was like, let me give it a shot and go. And I can tell you, like, I was running for f- like 10 minutes. I had good music on. And the first 10 minutes, I was aware, you know, yeah. felt a bit of heat back and everything. And then I remember like 25 minutes into my run, I was like, oh, shit, my mask. Because I came to like wipe my face or whatever. And there was a mask there. And it's like, like you just get into the and you forget about that's it. Great. I, yeah, I got used that, to it. And then That's how powerful the mind is, though. Like, you're a positive dude and you find like... Your brain's different than most, is all. <laughs> yeah, get, good, it's just, it's just that, that the fact um, that like people were saying, like, just put on a mask and it'll reduce the spread rate by 70%, I thought was was a very low requ- yeah. like re- low requirement. I think, and like, that just I, shows how you can't trust Americans to really do anything <laughs> that they don't want to do. I that's mean, it's, true. I hate to say it, and I love America. It's, uh, of course, it's likewise. But it is it's just exhausting. I mean, they found a way to make a virus political. Like they found, like, like, I, I would have. It's not an ideology. It's a goddamn virus that's yeah. killing people. And some yeah. people are still finding a way to be like, no, nah, uh, uh, it's some Trump. Uh, yeah, yeah. Trump. It's like I had, I had a Republican friend who was like, this whole thing is just so that Trump doesn't get reelected. I'm like, my country in the Middle East, Lebanon is shut yeah. down. Dubai is shut. They're doing what? Why? Yeah, you think that like uh, why 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 do you guys think that the world centers around you to that extent? I'm not when I say you guys, I don't mean Americans. I mean people yeah. like that, and I don't mean you Republicans. To, those kinds of people. Or I'm like, you, do had you to kill Italians to make sure Trump <laughs> doesn't get, doesn't make any sense. There's no logic there. No, I'm like, are you serious? Is that really what you think? They're like, yeah, and they have these conspiracies and how they're gonna pay them back, and then they give them. And I'm like, dude, no, it's just not how it happens because nobody. Right. In Lebanon, it's like, I'm going to shut down my business because, you know, Hillary Clinton's my girl. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't make any sense. No. Anyways. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's so, I think it's funny, too, that, that that guy you had that conversation with probably, he doesn't even know there's other countries. Like, everything in yeah. his mind is just like, he knows they about ex- America. Yeah, he knows they exist, but he's never visited yeah. them. He's never yeah. gone out of the country. Uh, he still says things to me like, man, you sound so American. <laughs> I am oh, really? American. Yeah, which is so great. <laughs> yeah, I've often been described that. that you know, what's yeah. funny is I've had that happen like, uh, you know, most of my life, but like especially in the last 10 years where people are like, oh, my, I'll do something. They go, oh, you're so white. And you're like, yeah. Yeah. I'm white. I am. That's- I'm fa- like, <laughs> it's like. I've often been described as white. It's very weird to tell a Jewish person, like, man, you're so Jewish, or to tell a white person, you're being so white. It's like, yeah, we yeah, are. We it, are. It, that's things. who we are. That's that guy, I stayed friends with him. I actually met him at a show in Utah nice. because he came up to me after the show and he said, are you really that? And I, it became a joke of mine. It's, it's a true story, though. He goes, are you really an Arab or are you just saying that? And I, and I told him at the time, I'm like, I don't think anybody just says they're an Arab in America. Do you know what I'm saying? That's part of my shtick. Yeah, I don't think anybody's like, you know what's going to help me get ahead in this industry? <laughs> if Although I- M- Mencia did something similar. You know, he's like, uh, he's Honduran. 
And he's like, if I just call myself Mexican, I'll wait get all a these second, Mexican Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Carlos Mencia isn't, isn't he's not Mexican. Mexican. What? No, he's not Mexican. He totally made that up. And not and what makes it even more crazy what? is is that he uses the term like beaner and he yeah. says all these things and yeah. he's like he basically cut like does kind of a bad George Lopez impression. Yes. And everything is about being Mexican and you know, he learned Spanish, but he's he's not he's not Mexican. Just another Carlos Mencia lie to the Jesus yeah. Christ. Okay. Isn't that weird? Yeah. That is very weird, man. God damn. <laughs> yeah. Well, it I'm glad that you as a white person cleared that up. You're so white, yeah, Jeff. About time. I'm breaking news. <laughs> his real name's Ned. It's not even Carlos. Wait, is this a joke or are you serious? That's it's real. His real name's Ned. Yeah, I swear to God. It's like uh, Larry the Cable Guy is as much a cable guy okay, as that Carlos I know. Mencia yeah, that, is but, uh, Mexican. Yeah, crazy, right? Are you, are, you for, are you fucking with me? I swear to God, if you're fucking real. with me. No, it's 100% real. Is his last name Mencia? Look it up. I don't think so. Jeez. Okay. Do you uh, mind? I just want to. I'm, I, this is blowing yeah, my. It. Okay. Hold on. Carlos Mencia, real name. Holy fucking shit. It's Ned Arnell Mencia. I know, but I wonder if Mencia is legally changed. Yeah, it could be. See? And he's Honduran. And he's Honduran. Crazy, right? This is. Okay, you know what? Hey, We've learned so I'll much take. from you today, Jeff Dye. Uh, I don't. People don't usually say that to me, but I'm happy to hear it. Even though you're white, Jeff Die, you uh, <laughs> you still have a lot to offer. <laughs> that is such a funny thing. I've been doing this whole like these last two weeks because it's been a dangerous time to be a white guy. Mm. Uh, is whenever someone calls me white, I go, "Excuse me." <laughs> <laughs> Did you say you people? You. I think what you meant is German, Spanish. Jewish American. I think that's what you meant. Anglo Saxon. I'm going to give you a chance to rid. Don't just blanket me with white. There's no. What are you talking about? It's not fair. Oh, my goodness. Dude, I've I love. Through, I've been through enough these last two weeks, you know? Yeah, I've you've, been enough. You've, 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 it's been rough for you. It's been a, I've been taking the quarantine real serious during these last few weeks. I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, my God, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when are we gonna video game stream, man? Uh, very soon. I'm gonna I'd after. I'm gonna call you later today to understand how you do your video game streams and see if we can okay. if we can cross streams. Yeah, I don't know. Um, so I've never streamed video games. Oh, that makes uh, things easier. Then I'll bring you into my stream. Yeah, and that's, that's how we'll perfect. do it. And we do a trivia okay. night on Sundays where I play with like the audience and we give them a hundred bucks to nice. whoever wins. And uh, yeah. we do it. It's a voice channel. So having a comedian in on that voice channel would actually, I've never done that before. It might be like the greatest idea ever. Yeah, so. I literally, every time I've seen you at the Comedy Magic Club or I mean, I'm, I'm even thinking it as I've listened, I was like, I want to work with this guy. My like, man. I love, I love what you do. I love your style. I love every, I, I would, I'm, oh, every dude. time with that, I go, I got to work. With Thank you, man. So let's work yeah. in, let's do games. Let's start there. Let's do it. Done. Sounds fun. Okay, I'll hit you right. up. I'm going to go stream in a bit, and then I'll hit you up when I'm done, and we'll figure it out. But uh, before uh, yeah. I let you go, I want to ask you a few rapid-fire questions that we ask every guest. Right. Um, we already asked you one, which was what your favorite book was. Um, but uh, what is your – and we asked you what your favorite movie was. So that what did I say my favorite book was? Your book was the Ted – Oh, yeah, Ted Turner. Ted Turner. Uh, so yeah. I was like, wait, I don't remember that. And uh, – no, you see, I listen. I listen. All right. I'll uh, say – 12 Rules for Chaos, or no, 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos was a life-changing book. 12, what was it called? 12 Rules for Life and Anecdote for Chaos by Jordan B. Peterson. That's my, that's my hands down my favorite book. Okay, I'm Ted gonna... Turner's just fresh in my brain. Okay, all right, yeah. good, good to know. Uh, next question, what's your favorite song if you had to choose one? Uh, anything by Creedence Clearwater, so uh, that's trying a great to think. Choice. Yeah, I don't know. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but... Pretty much Creedence Clearwater. I love Creedence. Okay. I'm like uh, the Big Lebowski. Okay. Uh, when all is said and done, many, 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 many years from now, what would you like you, the legacy of Jeff Dye to be? I want people to... Uh, you know, I want people to think out, say, oh, that was a funny guy, but I think I want them to say he was always very kind to me. That's what's most important to me is uh, I value kindness. And so I hope that like when I'm dead or at a few or someone's at my funeral they say oh that was like one of the kindest dudes i've ever known 
That's a beautiful answer. God damn, man. That's a perfect way Thanks. to end this podcast, my brother. Thank you so much for spending time with Thank us Thank you, today, man. man. Yeah, absolutely. Let's I talk later. I appreciate you. I'll talk to you later. You have a great day. Enjoy your you masks. Too. Love you, buddy. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? What a guy, huh? I love that man. Big shout out to him. Give him a follow on all of his socials. He's a good human being who I adore. Um, yeah. Thanks for watching, you guys. I will see you uh, with another episode coming in hot in like literally today there's another episode if you want to listen to it so um yeah thanks you guys i love you guys and um yeah, rate review subscribe just whatever